Hello, everyone. Welcome to our week eight lecture on operons, post-transcriptional control, and cancer. So this content uh, shows up on the bio-biochem portion of the exam. Um, I have six questions here that we're going to go over tonight and then talk about content related to this uh, um, these questions. As always here, I have the group me linked. If you want to be added, you can go to this link or you can also email me and we can add you to the group me. I have our Instagram here linked where we post updates about our courses. And uh, this is also the link to our YouTube channel where we post our uh, lectures. And this is the link that you can go to to see this lecture tonight. Um, and we have two lectures a week, Sunday recorded release and a Monday recorded release um, that will be released around 8.30 p.m. All right, so first question here is about operons. I'll give everyone about a minute or two to do this question. Uh, so read it to yourself silence, silently, get your answer, and then we will go over it. All right, so the first question here states, when analyzing the DNA of a prokaryotic, prokaryotic organism and beginning at the five prime end, what component of DNA will be present first? So firstly, I would want to just think about the structure of a prokaryotic DNA, and, um, and then I will go from there and analyze my questions. So the answer to this question is D. So if you didn't get this answer, that's okay. We will go over this um, as well as some other things in the following slides. So operons, um, operons are only present in prokaryotes. So they're only things that you see in prokaryotic DNA, not eukaryotic DNA. And what operons are, they are multiple genes on a strand of prokaryotic DNA that code for a single strand of mRNA. Um, so the term for this is that the mRNA is polycystronic. Um, it just means that we have multiple genes um, on this one mRNA product, um, and it's initiated by one single promoter. This is the simplest example of control of gene expression that we see in prokaryotes, and a very common thing that you will also see on the MCAT. Um, and then the components of the operon. Um, first, we have structural genes. These code for proteins of interest. So when we are coding for a um, for specific proteins, these will all be produced together. So they likely have functions that act together. Um, and you can see here, this is the part where we have structural genes. Um, and as we see from... Uh, this diagram here, our regulatory gene is going to be closer to our five prime end. If we define this as our five prime end and three prime end, um, which it is. Um, so the regulatory gene will occur first and our structural gene is actually the most towards the three prime end. Um, now the operator site is the region of DNA that can bind to a repressor protein. Um, so that is here, and note that this is before the promoter. So what this usually acts as is the repressor kind of blocks um, the uh, RNA polymerase because the RNA polymerase is where um, it binds the promoter. So it usually um, acts as a blockage point when it binds to a repressor in order um, for the gene to not be tr um, transcribed. And then now we have our regulatory gene, which is closest to our five prime end that codes for the repressor activator or inducer proteins, depending on the um, specific operon. Now, the types of control and systems we have in operons, we have negative control. Um, this is binding of a protein to DNA that stops transcription. Um, a positive control is binding of a protein to DNA that will increase transcription. 
And then we also have inducible systems. These are not transcribed under normal conditions um, because the repressor is bound to the operator. Um, and then repressible systems uh, normally are transcribed because the repressor is inactive under normal conditions. Um, and so going back to um, the control, what it means to be normally turned off is that it's not producing the gene in high quantity of, under normal conditions. Um, and the reason we have these, or prokaryotes have these, um, is to conserve energy. It takes a lot of energy to make RNA. It takes a lot of energy to make proteins. So this is just a way for the prokaryotes to conserve energy and only make proteins when they do need it. Um, and then now we'll move on to question two. Here we'll talk about um, two examples that are combinations of these systems and controls. All right, so um, I will give everyone about one to two minutes again. So pause the video when we go to the next slide. Um, and then we will discuss the question and then the content related to the question. All right, uh, so the question here is, when arginine is present, it binds to a protein that will change shape, form a complex, then bind to the operator on the arginine operon. This will decrease transcription of arginine and is most similar to which of the following. So these examples that are given here are uh, the LAC operon and the TRIP operon, which are common examples that you should know uh, that are examples of inducible operons and repressible operons. Um, so the answer to this question, um, if you did not know, is D, the trip operon when tryptophan is present. And if you did not get this, these two examples, we will talk about more in depth in the next couple slides here. So first off, the lac operon, um, this is an example of an inducible system under negative control. Um, and the lac operon is a group of genes that metabolizes lactose in prokaryotes. Um, so when lactose is present in the cell, then this is when uh, the lac operon will be induced. Um, so what lac Z does, as you see here, it's we have three genes in the lac operon. So LAC-Z codes for beta-galactidase. Uh, this cleaves glucose and galactose, which make up lactose. Um, so this way we can then use it in the cell. LAC-Y codes for permease, and this is what transports lactose into the cell. LAC-A codes for transacetylase. This we don't actually need for lactose metabolism, but what it does is it transfers an acetyl group um, to the beta-galactidases. Um, uh, um, from acetyl-CoA, um, but again, it's not necessary for lactose metabolism, but it, um, it does help. So we also have LAC-I. This is what codes for the LAC repressor protein, um, and this is present upstream of the genes that we were just talking about. Um, then we have the CRP gene, which codes for the catabolite uh, activator protein. Um, now, a little bit more in depth of how this works. So when we have lactose available, this is when the lac operon is induced. Um, the lac repressor protein, which is the repressor, uh, will always be expressed and will be bound to the operator under normal conditions. Um, so here we have um, this, that will be bind to the operator here when it is not induced and so when we don't have lactose. Um, so it will prevent transcription of this, again, to conserve energy. However, when lactose is present, um, it's metabolite allolactose. So once it gets into the cell, it will form a metabolite allolactose. This will bind the repressor. Then the repressor will not be able to bind the operator. And um, now RNA polymerase will be able to transcribe as there's nothing uh, blocking the movement of the RNA polymerase. However, um, 
when we another factor in this is not just the present of presence of lactose, but it's also um, glucose not being present will um, have the lac operon be strongly expressed. So this occurs because when glucose is low, uh, CAMP is high, and this is going to uh, bind CAP. Um, so glucose controls adenylate cyclase, which is what converts ATP to CAMP. Um, so that means that um, when adenylate cyclase is active, then we have more CAMP, and this um, complex helps activate the RNA polymerase. Uh, these is just what show um, what occurs in the lac operon um, under the different circumstances. So basically what we just talked about, um, understanding this chart is going to be important to understand um, these inducible, inducible operons. All right. So we have the uh, trip operon um, here. So this is an example of a repressible um, operon that is under negative control. So the trip operon is a group of genes that will synthesize tryptophan. We have these different genes involved um, that is going, as you see here. Um, and then as we also saw in the inducible operon, we have operator, we have our promoter, um, and then we have uh, trip R, which is actually upstream here, and that's going to code for the repressor protein. Um, so how this works is that um, in the presence of tryptophan, it will bind to the, res the uh, repressor protein here, um, and then this will uh, bind, which binds to the operator and RNA synthesis is blocked. However, when tryptophan is not present, we have the repressor that will be produced anyways. But since it's not bound to tryptophan, it will not be, um, it will not associate with the operator, and RNA polymerase will be able to, um, will be able to move down the gene and transcribe these different genes. All right. Uh, so question three here is now regulation of gene expression. Um, I will give everyone one to two minutes again uh, to uh, read this question silent, silently to yourself and then uh, figure out the answer and then we will discuss. All right, uh, so question three here states, if the histones that DNA is wrapped around in a eukaryotic, eukaryotic organism are acetylated, transcription will, um, so our answer choices are increase, decrease, not be affected, or we cannot uh, tell without more information. Um, so the answer to this question is A, increase. So we just have to know that one of the regulations of gene expression is acetylation. Um, and what happens during acetylation is that we are adding a, um, we are decreasing the positive charge around the um, certain, um, around a lysine, which is uh, an amino acid that is on the uh, DNA strand so, or on the histones, sorry, because it is a, histones are proteins. Um, and the DNA is wrapped around uh, these histones. So because we are decreasing our positive charge, the negatively charged DNA is not as attracted to it. So it will uh, be unwound. And then the um, polymerases are more likely to get in there and to transcribe um, this section of DNA. Um, so now we will uh, further talk about gene expression and different things we see here um, that acetylation is one of them, but that is only one. There's a few different kinds. Um, so we have uh, promoters. This is where RNA polymerases bind to begin transcription. Um, in eukaryotes, we see this about 25 base pairs upstream of the starting point of the gene. 
transcription factors. These bind to specific binding motifs on DNA that affect transcription. We also have enhancers that are regions of DNA outside the normal promoter regions that influence transcription. So these can actually be found a uh, thousand base pairs upstream or downstream actually. And what they do is they kind of loop around and they will make everything closer together and everything will just be um, more attracted to each other as they have uh, more affinity during, for these. Uh, the transcription factors have more affinity towards these enhancer regions and getting everything grouped together will uh, increase the likelihood of transcription. Uh, we also have, um, so these three actually here are also present in prokaryotes, but um, not the specificities of it. Um, now, here we go into these things that are um, specific to eukaryotes. So here we also have uh, gene duplication, which can increase transcription because gene copies are made. So there are more genes that can be transcribed. Um, something else that we have is heterochromatin. So this is tightly coiled DNA because the DNA is so tight together, you can't get the polymerases in there in order to uh, transcribe certain genes. Euchromatin is the opposite. So this is loosely coiled DNA, um, and this will increase transcription because it's more loose. Um, and the polymerases can go in there and more easily transcribe the certain regions. Um, histone acetylation, um, as we discussed, decreases the positive charge on the lysine residues um, of the histone proteins, uh, therefore creating euchromatin, um, in increasing transcription. Um, and then we have DNA methylation as well. Um, so this works to silence gene expression as methyl groups are added to adenine or cytosine on DNA. Um, and the it's important for the MCAT to know the differences here in prokaryotics and uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So because prokaryotes are more simple um, in terms of gene expression, um, they just they quickly adapt. So that's what we see in prokaryotes. Um, we have activators, we have repressors, we have sometimes enhancers, we have these promoters, and it's a pretty, pretty simple um, term. It's a pretty ex uh, simple way to um, control gene expression, where in eukaryotes, there's a lot more. Um, eukaryotes don't adapt as quickly. Um, however, it's more sophisticated. Um, and another thing in gene expression is that we have a nuclear envelope. Um, in eukaryotes where we do not have that in prokaryotes. And this adds some spatial and temporal control as well uh, for transcription. All right, our fourth question here is now post-transcriptional control. So this is control after transcription. I will give everyone about one to two minutes to uh, read this to yourself. Uh, answer the question. Um, so you might want to pause the video once I go to the next slide. All right. Um, so the question here states, uh, post-transcriptional regulation in eukaryotes can occur by So here in this question, we have to uh, know whether know what the what different types of post transcriptional regulation there are. We have a five prime cap. We have um, a poly A tail at the three prime end. Um, we also have um, splicing, which is um, not splicing out exons. So we know B is wrong. It's splicing out introns. A here is adding a modify, modified uh, methyl guanosine to the three prime end, which is also wrong because it is to the five, five prime end. Um, and C here is adding at adenosines, which is the poly A tail to the three prime end of the mRNA strand. Um, so that one is right. Um, and then D here is wrong. Um, and if you didn't get this, we'll talk about the uh, different regulations in eukaryotes in the following slides. All right, um, so five prime cap, this is the uh, methyl guanosine, the modified methyl guanosine 
that uh, I had just mentioned previously. So this is added to the five prime end of the mRNA transcript um, in order to form the mature mRNA. So the purpose of this, uh, there's three things. So it protects against degradation. Degradation uh, occurs by exonucleases in the cell. Uh, it also promotes ribosome binding and it regulates nuclear export of the mRNA transcript into the cytoplasm in order to be translated. Um, the poly A tail has the same things, um, but it also helps to terminate transcription. So once the, uh, the polymerase gets to the end here, it knows to stop uh, transcribing. So we also have uh, in post-transcriptional regulation, we also have splicing, and this occurs to cut out introns uh, that need to be removed in order to create the mature mRNA strand. So as we can see here, we have um, exons and we have introns. And these are different regions of mRNA. So exons are what is going to be in the final transcript, while the introns are meant to not be in the final transcript. Um, and this is mediated. This is mediated by the spliceosome, which is a complex of different proteins um, and small RNA molecules. So small nuclear RNA molecules, SNRAs, RNAs, um, and then these will bind uh, small nuclear ribonucleic particles or SNRPs. Um, but this doesn't only occur where we are only cutting out introns and we were cutting out the same introns every time. So this here, alternative splicing, we cut out different sequences and this increases the diversity of the proteins we have and just increases the complexity of our eukaryotic cells. So here are just different types of alternative splicing that can occur. We have constitutive splicing, which we just are splicing out all the introns um, exon skipping, sometimes we might skip over an exon. You can see here that we have skipped over this yellow exon. Um, alter um, alternative splicing, we are just, here we have a little bit of the exon that we have um, spliced out, but we have left a little part of it. Um, we have also done that here, just more towards the three prime end, and then intron retention. Sometimes we do leave in introns, um, and that, again, will just increase the diversity of our eukaryote. All right, uh, question five here. Uh, we're moving on to mutations and cancer. So this question will be related to mutations, um, and then we'll talk about more, can more about cancer in the next question. All right, so take time to read the question to yourself, uh, pause the video, and we will discuss. All right, so the question here states, if the adenine highlighted in red above, you, say that, you see that here, is replaced by a guanine, what kind of mutation has occurred? Um, so we have A, point mutation, B, insertion, C, deletion, and D, inversion. So this question requires you to know the different types of mutations there are. Um, since we, in this case, have just re replaced uh, one of the base pairs with another one, then it is going to be A, a point mutation. Um, if you did not get this one, we will talk about the different types of mutations in the following slides. So we have point mutations, which is when a single base pair will replace or substitute another one for um, missense mutations. As you can see here, this is when uh, one base pair is replaced by another one. Um, and this actually changes the protein that is coded for. We have nonsense mutations, which code for a stop codon. So we have one that would be a normal uh, will be coded for a normal protein, will then instead just so, stop, uh, code for a stop codon, and this will truncate the uh, transcript itself. 
Now, a silent mutation, we do have a change in our base here, but we end up with the same amino acid. So it does not change the, uh, the translated protein. We also have insertions, which is the addition of one or more nucleotides and deletions remove one or more nucleotides. Insertions or deletions when it does not occur in a multiple of three because codons are in multiples of threes can cause a frame shift mutation where everything downstream from that mutation will then be um, will be not normal of what it should have been uh, coded for. So it'll be a completely different protein than it would otherwise. Uh, more types of mutations here, we have amplification. So this is when a portion of the chromosome or specific genes are just amplified. So you see here, this is the normal chromosome, um, but then we have just amplified this region right here. We also have inversion. So it's when a sequence is reversed. Um, so you can see here is this will then be reversed. So the three prime and the five prime end are essentially just swapped and it's turned around. And we also have translocations. This is when sequences of different chromosomes are switched. Um, so we see that here, we just have, uh, you know, chromosome four here and chromosome 20, and they just take one region and they switch places. All right, so now cancer. Again, uh, take time to read the question to yourself, pause the video and we will discuss. All right, uh, so this question states, which of the following would not be expected to cause cancer? So in order to answer this question, you have to know that cancer often results from the gene coding sequence of a receptor, um, as these can cause a cell to uh, proliferate out of control. However, errors in translation don't really have significant function uh, effect on the function. So um, in this case here, all of them are related to some kind of uh, mutation in uh, the uh, some some sort of, sort of cell receptor here, um, except um, for a mistake in the translation of a cell surface receptor. Um, and since it does not have a significant effect on the function of the cell, it's not likely uh, to cause cancer. So our answer here is B. So now I will go on a little bit to uh, talk about cancer and how that occurs. Um, so cancer can occur by uh, mutagens, carcinogens, or um, spontaneous mutations. Um, mutations here in proto-oncogenes can create oncogenes. So what proto-oncogenes do is that they are genes in cells that regulate cell growth and differentiation. So if these are affected, then this can cause a cell to proliferate out of control. These can occur by deletions, insertions, point mutations, um, which can cause hyperactive proteins um, or overexpressed proteins. When gene, gene amplification occurs in these type of genes, um, this can increase the mRNA stability as there are more of these genes um, and they're more likely to thus be transcribed and then translated. Um, and then it can overexpress the protein as a result. And chromosomal rearrangements can also uh, cause overexpressed proteins or hyperactive pro proteins. And an example of a proto-oncogene that can become an oncogene is the SARC gene. Um, so this here is just the structure of it. Uh, knowing the specificities of this is not important. Now we also have tumor suppressor genes. Um, so these are genes that promote apoptosis or halt the cell cycle. Um, we also have something here called the two-hit hypothesis. So this is when both alleles must be mutated for a tumor suppressor gene because the other allele could then produce the fully functioning gene itself. Um, meaning that we, even if you have one allele that is knocked out, 
we could then produce the actual protein because we still have the other allele that is functioning. Um, and then an example of a tumor suppressor gene um, that is that when mutated, it actually does, uh, it's associated with a lot of different types of cancers um, is P53. Um, so this is involved in proliferation, apoptosis, uh, metastasis, um, activates DNA repair, and it's also the gateway for the cell to proceed from G1 to the S phase. Um, you can see here all these different things P53 is involved in. Um, and when you mess up the sequence, it can cause uh, issues forming a fully function functioning protein. And because it has so many very important uh, functions in the cell cycle, then um, this can eventually lead to cancer. All right, uh, so that is it for the lecture today. Um, thanks for everyone for watching. If you do have any questions, you can email me uh, here um, and then feel free to reach out with any specific questions or wanting to join the group me. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your night.